Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. Money, 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 money. (laughs) Oh my goodness. What 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 a intro. (laughs) <laughs> yes. So I thought I would start with um, the word money because our guest today is going to enlighten us on stewardship and, um, you know, challenge our hearts and inspire our hearts about our money. And um, this is another one where you're going to feel your toes stepped on a little bit, but that's always good. Um so value um, all of Garrett's words uh, today. And so I'm excited about what we're going to get to hear. But before we get started, I wanted to ask you guys, how did allowance work in your home growing up when you were a child? My allowance was non-existent till I was in high school. But as even a a small child, um, I utilized my lunch money as my allowance. I I moved those from the lunch funds to figure out ways to not eat lunch or (laughs) get from friends and spent my uh, money on video games. And and there was a a little quick sack next to our, our bus stop and we would go to the bus stop early and play excite bike or Mike Tyson's knockout inside the gas station and spend our lunch money until I got caught. Now, when you said spend it on on video games, I thought you meant buying video games. I was going to ask you how many lunches equated one game, but you're talking quarters in the uh, video game. Back in my day. I was going to say, you and I are of the same era. I, Pac-Man and, and Galaga occupied way too much of my, my money back then. What was your go-to game? Uh, it was Excite Bike or Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, because those two, I could make a quarter stretch a lot longer than those other games. Like I might be able to have a little money for some milk and, you know, a snack at the end of lunch. If I played a game I wasn't good at, then it, I'm with you. Eat my quarters. Yeah. Galaga, I could spend 15, 20 minutes on one quarter, but on Donkey Kong, it was like three or four minutes. Now it's done. Yeah. So <laughs> it got me. So, so we are, we've got Garrett teaching us about money and, and not only teaching us, but uh, teaching us to teach our kids. And I, I must confess, you know, you, you raised the question about allowance, uh, Marianne. I, I don't know. Maybe my parents gave us, uh, g- gave me, I was an only child, gave me an allowance, but I don't remember it. But also don't remember not, uh, you know, being a, needing something. I mean, we, when we went somewhere, they would just pay for or do whatever I wanted. But the problem with that is when I got into college, I didn't know how to handle my own bank account. I didn't know how to budget. Nobody ever told me those kinds of things. And boy, it's set up for me making a lot of mistakes uh, along the way and not knowing what to do and how to save and and all of those. And I, I know at least when I helped my kids set up uh, their bank account, I went with them to the bank for both of them. And I was waiting for the uh, bank person to say, you know, give them, a, you know, any advice they have to to give them. And I remember with my daughter, the uh, bank guy handed the, uh, uh, the temporary check said her others will come in the mail. He said, here's a register. He says, I don't know very many people that record it or balance it anymore. He said, you can just look online and see it and keep up with it. You know? And I'm like, my mom would be horrified because she did. I remember her coming over and balancing our check account and checking account one time and getting it reconciled. And, you know, those are things that I was just never taught how to do in, in growing up. So 
Uh, I didn't come into the adult world with very much knowledge like Garrett's talking about. I've had to learn that on my own and learn it from a lot of mistakes that I've made along the way. What about you? Did you like you got millions, didn't you, Marianne, growing up? Oh, gosh, no. We were really poor. And I just got to tell you guys, inflation is a cuss word. Um, (laughs) The value (laughs) of quarters in the uh, 80s and 90s is we didn't get dollars. I mean, it was more cents. So allowance was there, but under, I'm, I'm kind of with both of you guys, like understanding budget and saving and giving those concepts were not necessarily poured into me. Um, and I love to shop. I'm just going to make a confession here. I love to shop. And to be honest with you, it's not always a healthy thing. It's, it's a form of coping sometimes. And so I think, you know, anytime I hear a heart about stewardship, it always reorients uh, my, my heart and my living, uh, to make sure that, that I'm being wise and mindful of what God's, you know, entrusted me with. And so, um, I'm excited about this conversation today. I think, um, all of us are going to walk away challenged and encouraged to be really practical and intentional about having this conversation with our children. Well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, when we talk about stewardship, you know, sometimes you get uh, promotions from us on various areas of D6 family ministry or, you know, promotions of the books that people have written on on our show. And we try to balance this with things that we wish to steward, items that we have produced that cost you absolutely nothing, such as this very podcast or such as Top Reads we talked about recently. But I want to I share one more with you that uh, does occasionally touch on the very topic they're on today, and that is Splink. If you're mm-hmm. not familiar with it, you need to sign up and uh, get onto Splink. And uh, it's absolutely free and comes out once a week. And it's just creative ideas that you get to do with your kids. And uh, I, I just think it's helpful when we touch on topics like finance, Splink will occasionally hit finance. It'll talk about creativity. It'll talk about conversation. There'll be so much uh, down there on that. And, you know, when you hear the uh, these insights, sometimes we don't know how to begin that. And Splink helps you begin that. So go to d6family.com. You'll see a place to sign up for Splink. And uh, you can certainly enjoy that. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to get right into the interview with Garrett. And when we come back on the other side of it, we're going to kind of debrief and give you some insights for how this is transferable to your family. Are you concerned about your church's future? Will it serve another generation? The Bible says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet we often only know how to connect to Abraham. Let D6 help you connect with each generation. Your kids and grandkids are counting on you. D6 comes from the principles of Deuteronomy 6 and helps what happens in church also happen at home. Curriculum you can trust. Discipleship that connects. We are joined today with Garrett Dickerson. He lives in Clarksville, Tennessee with his wife and three boys. Garrett is currently the Regional Development Director in the South Region with Thrivent. He attended school at Lipscomb University for his undergraduate degrees in marketing and graphic arts. He holds a master's degree in education administration. He is a fraternal insurance counselor and certified long-term care counselor. In his spare time, he referees college football games at the Division I level. Garrett serves as the Vice President of the Board of the Yao Foundation and co-founder, along with his wife, of the Grant James Foundation. He also serves as a deacon at his local church. He also hosts his own podcast, the Garrett Dickerson Podcast, and we are thrilled to have him today on the D6 Podcast. Thanks for joining us, Garrett. Thank you, Casey. I I, I really appreciate you listing off all of those things. I really do appreciate it. (laughs) I mean... I've known you for a little while, but I just feel like I got to know you so much more with that information. It's so great. There's a lot of layers to me, Casey. (laughs) Just got to peel them back one at a time. You're just an onion. You're just an onion. 
Well, right. one of the things that I know that you're passionate about is helping people understand finances and how to use them in a biblical manner, uh, which is what I'm excited to talk to you about today. So why, why would you say that helping people with financial guidance is important to you? I know it's not just your job, but you actually see it as a ministry and it's your lifestyle too. You live it out. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, really appreciate that question. I think that you know, it's always great to, to consider people's stories. And that's one thing that I really enjoy about being in the career that I am is you get to meet so many people and you get to hear their stories and to understand um, what makes them them and their backstory and their history. I think there's a couple things in my history, um, one of which is you mentioned that I, I have a degree in education. Um, there was a time in my career professionally where I was a teacher and I, I served um, as a teacher in a lot of different subject matter. Um, I taught uh, graphic design. I taught beginning computers. I taught a class that I, I, I uh, developed called Guitar for Songwriters. That was pretty cool. And uh, beginning business and personal finance. And I, I was kind of in a place where I, I did all the extracurricular classes and I was just teaching anything they'd pay me to teach. <laughs> and one of those being personal finance, what I found in that experience that I didn't anticipate is how many times parents would email me or call me and they would say things like this, Casey, Garrett, thank you so much for teaching the kids what you're teaching them. We don't feel equipped. We were never taught this in school. Um, we did not have a kind of relationship with our parents where they were handing down knowledge about about finances about the money in our house to us and so we don't know how to hand that down to our kids but what's happening is they're coming home and what you're teaching them is they're teaching us and it's changing our family and how appreciative they were for that and that knowledge and i think for me casey that was the original like that was the the point where that began to be in me and how meaningful that was. Fast forward several years, um, I stepped out of teaching and took a position as a marketing director for a healthcare company and started just getting this sense in my time there. I got to work alongside the gentleman that started that company and how fulfilled they were in creating something from scratch and seeing that built and the, and the people that they impacted in doing that. And I decided I wanted to do that. And so I explored a lot of different avenues, but ultimately landed in that experience that I had as a teacher. And I realized that there were so many people that didn't have the story that I had with finances and being passed down from my mom and my dad to me, that they needed me, that, th that there were people that needed me to help them in that area of their life. And so for, for me, that's really where it started, was in the classroom and getting to see that the impact that it was having on the family. Um, and so I, I started exploring that and I, I landed with Thrivent um, to be able to do that in, in my career. And I'm so very, very thankful that I did. Well, I'm thankful too. I mean, uh, Aaron and I have benefited from it um, and just really appreciate it. I mean, I know that you know Aaron and, and myself and our story. I didn't come from a family that had money. Aaron sure didn't come from a family that had any money. So you put the two of us together. You know, we got married when we were young and we didn't really know how to make good financial decisions. Uh, we failed a lot, um, but ultimately, um, you know, began to get um, some uh, investment in us in how to handle our money and uh, make some good decisions. We do a lot of premarital counseling with some of our former students and we love to get to tell them that, listen, like we were terrible in the beginning, but you know, we've gotten a handle on some things. And I, I talk with young adults all the time and I know that you do too. They just kind of feel like I didn't really get that wisdom passed down, just like those students that you were talking about. Um, and you know, I, I feel like, there are some things that maybe you can offer to some young adults who are listening. It may be even older adults, um, but 
you know, maybe they're later on in life or something like that. But um, what are some things that you think young adults in particular would benefit to hear right now about not having regret with financial decisions later on in their life? Casey, as I have started in my career, in, in the world of finance in particular, um, I guess I even going in, I knew that there was a place for me to to minister and to live out talents and ambition and passion and mission that I have. But I guess I didn't fully comprehend the need until I was actually living it with people day in and day out. And did you know, Casey, that over 60% of the people in the United States have less than $400? So over 60% of the people in the United States cannot cover a $400 emergency. And I think that that is, there's just a lack of financial literacy in our, in our country. Um, there's also a very distinct connection between um, money and our health. When you consider that the number one cause um, for divorce in many cases is, is financial challenges, that's often cited that way. When you consider that one of the um, number one causes for stress in general are cited as financial challenges, and then when you consider that the number one cause for uh, a, a large majority of diagnoses, I believe it's around 80% in the United States, are stress-related, there is a direct connection between financial stress and strain to your relational health your physical health, and your spiritual health, in my opinion. And so one thing that I would share with, with young, young adults, don't continue to perpetuate that lack of financial literacy. Don't be afraid to ask for help. We all deserve an opportunity to have somebody come alongside us understand us, and begin helping us in our financial journey. I've talked to people. I've talked to millionaires. They both ask the same kinds of questions. That's what's amazing about it, is that regardless of your life stage or how much money you think you do or don't have, a lot of the questions are the same. And so it's never too late to start and it's never too early to start trying to improve your financial journey and improves maybe not the right word, but to embrace your financial journey and to not run from it, embrace it. Yeah. And we'll get to some of those tools here in just a little bit. I know that you're going to get to share. Um, I'm excited for, for you to get to share those, but you know, as, as a parent, again, being second generation of, you know, coming from, people who don't have money. And now I'm raising my own kids, trying to teach them about money and even the hard lessons that I've learned. Um, but I still don't have it all figured out. So how am I supposed to raise my kids to understand if I don't fully understand? So I, I think I'm going to share some things that I would say just, I think are good parenting uh, concepts in general, not just around finances. And that, I think that's where we, we get hung up is that it it's, has to be complicated and it has to feel heavy and it doesn't. And so some things that I would suggest as ways to, to help with your kids in this area to pass down good financial habits is to first, I, I mentioned, don't be afraid to ask for help. Model for your kids that it's okay to ask for help. Talk to them about you going and speaking to someone about the finances in your home. Don't, don't be afraid to ask for help and model that for your kids. That'd be the first thing. The second thing that I would say is proactively provide learning opportunities. That, like many other things with kids, doesn't just happen by accident. Be intentional about it. Provide those learning opportunities. Um, so for an example of this would be <laughs> growing up at, in, in my house when I was a kid, and I'll, I'll, I'll reference my mom quite a bit. My, mom, my dad did a lot to, 
to guide me financially too. But my mom, I remember a lot from her. She was a stay at home mom. And so obviously she was extremely formative for me. And so I remember when we would do chores, we didn't get allowance. We got commission. And the concept being, if you don't work, you don't get paid. My mom wasn't setting aside anything for me. She's not allowing for me to have anything. And, and so I think that in and of itself, like I remember that. And it, it drove home a point of, if you don't do, then you don't get. <laughs> and so I think that's just an example of, of try to provide learning opportunities for your kids in that. That's number two. And then number three, I would say, don't be afraid to talk about it. That's a big cultural shift from probably a generation away from me where my grandparents, you, they did not talk about money. You don't talk about it. It's not brought up. It's none of your kids' business. You know, you, you, you kids, you mind your own business. Let mom and dad handle this. My mom and dad started to talk about it more. And I think there's probably a healthy balance of that. Like you don't want to just necessarily tell, you know, you need to make things kid appropriate. Um, you don't need to, to set an unstable foundation. You never want them to feel like they're in, in an unstable environment because I think that could have greater impact than just the, the financial literacy component. But we talk about it with my boys, my wife and I. Um, we, we talk about that we're saving up to go on vacation. Mm-hmm. We talk about frankly, what mommy and daddy make and that there are other mommies and daddies that don't make that Mm -hmm. and that you're blessed and you're fortunate. And we, we worked hard to be to where we are. And there are other people that make more than us. And there are other people that make less than us. I think it's great to have those conversations. Yeah, those are, those are great points. Uh, I hope everyone, everyone listening is uh, listening like in their heart, you know, um, I, we have conversations with our boys all the time and, you know, I don't think it's typical for a four-year-old to say, is that too expensive, you know, <laughs> or is that in the budget? Uh, but that comes out of our boys' mouths because we want to help them understand stewardship and the budget and, you know, financial life. Um, but, you know, I say the word stewardship in that, we want to be very mindful of how we handle our time, our talent and our treasures and want to pass that down. But I also think that word stewardship is kind of handled a little loosely and maybe I'm wrong. Um, but what's your view on stewardship? You know, do, do you think um, there are certain things that we steward and how do we do, how do we do it? Yeah, I, I do believe in the concept of stewardship. Um, whether we we toss that around more than we should, I, I don't know. Um, but I do believe in the concept of stewardship, especially from a biblical perspective. And and so I do think that there is scripturally a basis for stewarding. And the, the concept being is that none of this is ours. Our creator has provided us with opportunity to have talent. You mentioned time, talent, and treasure. We have a finite amount of time, and and only God knows how much time we're all going to be here. Um, I don't believe we have a finite amount of talent. I think God gives us both the the ability to have natural talent and the ability to grow and learn talents, and that's part of stewarding both what we have been given and growing, you know, what's in front of us. And then the treasure concept. Obviously, I believe in stewarding what we have been given. Um, you know, you could get into things like actually giving back and tithing and those kinds of things. But I think overall the concept is money is a tool and stewarding is the ability to use it, to use it wisely. You know, James, in James, it says every good and perfect gift, I think it's James chapter one, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And we are called to use what we have. And that he has handed it to us to see how we will take care of it. Um, that's my 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 take on stewardship. Does yeah. that help, Casey? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you were talking earlier about your mom not giving you an allowance and stuff like that. You know, my boys, when they get money for their birthday, 
Mm-hmm. It burns a hole straight through their pocket. They just cannot wait to spend it on something that is just nonsense, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is uh, that they want to just spend it on. They just want to go to the store and uh, just buy something with it. They cannot just hold the money, which is obviously something that we're trying to break them of. Uh, but let's talk about this. Um, uh, give us some tips and tricks, conversations that we can have with our kids about how to steward their money well, even if it's a birthday money or an allowance or commission, whatever uh, that may be. Tell us about some of those. Yeah. So can I, can I share a few stories to, to answer this, Casey? So I like to reflect on what are my earliest memories? What were the most formative things in my life around money? And then how am I going to pass that same experience on to my boys? And so if I'm modeling the conversations that we could start or have with our kids, I would first lean into what are the things that I remember most. And so um, one of the very first things that I remember um, about money is going to church and my grandmother would give me a dollar to put in the plate at church as a part of giving. That was a foundational thing. Probably not nearly as much impact as if it was actually my dollar, but she was building that in me. That's probably my first memory. My next memory, very closely associated with that, is that when, when we did get that commission, my mom would have me set aside some, and she said, now, Garrett, when you have enough, we're going to go buy paper with it. And I was like, okay, great. And she'd get me all fired up, and I'd say, oh, we're going to go buy paper. And I, I remember sticking that into a mason jar that was in, and, and she would put it up, of course, as, you know, a four or five-year-old, I couldn't reach the top drawer in my room. And she would put that mason jar in my top drawer and we would take it out and we'd go get in the car. Um, I think we had a gray Honda Acura, if I remember correctly. We'd go down to a building and we'd walk in and she'd open up that mason jar and she'd hand it to a young lady behind this counter. And the young lady would hand back to me paper. Wait, is this like loose leaf paper? Is that what we're talking about? I thought you were talking about a newspaper. So she would take that paper and she'd roll it up and she'd put it in the in that mason jar. Well, when I graduated from high school, I was going through some things packing for college. And I found that old mason jar. And there had been tons of rolls of paper that were stuffed down in this mason jar. And they were savings bonds. Stop. And I had dozens of these savings bonds that all told was, wasn't much more than about a thousand dollars. But think of that. I remember that. And my mom was building this in me and it was almost, I don't know if she meant to do it this way, but it was like this chance to see looking back. I was like, Oh, like I'd forgotten that Mason jar was even in there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, several years later you go, man, look at what she was doing. She was teaching me to save. I just thought we were just buying paper and I was getting all jazzed up that we were buying paper. Let's go buy more paper and roll it out. (laughs) Absolutely. And and then the third thing that I remember, very similar to that, is that uh, when I was a kid at school, Fridays were ice cream day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were ice cream day for anybody else, but where I went to school, they were ice cream day. And when I would divide out my commission... I gave, I had some set aside for church. I had some to buy paper. And then I had a case. You remember those plastic wallets that had like the slit in them. They look kind of like a football and you squeeze them. That slit would open up the smiley face. Yes. 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 So I had a, I had a red one of those and I would stick my money down in that, that wallet and mine had a little chain on it. And when I would go to school on Fridays, buddy, I, I'd get up on Friday morning. I'd take that chain and I'd put it on my belt loop. <laughs> yeah, I, I was high rolling going into school. I was like, ladies, I'm about to ice creams all around because I got my commission money in my wallet. And what <laughs> in those stories, I feel like I'm 
I remember is essentially the three things that you do with money. You share it, you save it, and you can spend it. Pretty much everything that you think about that you do with money is one of those three things. And so that's a good example of how do you boil this down to make it simple? And so now I replicate that same experience with my boys. Teach your kids that there's three things you do with money. Spend, save, share. And if you did nothing else but as a parent, if you ask your kids, what's the three things you do with money? And they go spend, save, and share. Can you imagine the, the ripple impact that would have? If they just foundationally were able to rattle off, spend, save, share, spend, save, share, spend, save, share. And then you modeled for them how to do that. And whether that's allowance or commission or however you do that in your home and teaching them to, you're going to take this out and you do this with this and you do this with this. And so now my boys know if they've got three quarters, where's the first quarter go? Their church wallet. Where's the next quarter go? Goes in my savings bank. And I've, I've got my an example of a piggy bank that I have, but then the third one, they get to spend. You know how often they talk about spending their money? Not nearly as often as they ask to get their wallet to take it to church. And I think if now for you, Casey, if your boys got money burning in their pocket, that's not derogatory towards you at all. But I think if you've got um, if you've got an opportunity to build the three things conceptually within them, I would encourage all parents to do that. Yeah. And, you know, talking about savings, I mean, I would love for my bank account to always be fully funded. But there's a sense of security in, you know, having something in savings. Um, so what are some of your tips? And um, you just shared a few of those on, on how to teach our kids how to save. What are we saving for? Are we just going to continually save or is there an, a bigger item we're purchasing? Or, you know, what does that look like? Some of those conversations we can have. Yeah. So, you know, so that there's, I kind of hear two questions there. You know, what, what do we do as parents to actually start saving? And then how do we pass that down? Just just saving yeah. down to our kids. Um, I think one thing I've already touched on is is don't be afraid to ask for help. Is if if you don't know where to start, that's OK. Um, that's why there are people that professionally do that. And I think some things that a professional can help with is one asking tough questions that you're, you may not be willing to ask yourself and facilitating a conversation. So that's one of the things that, you know, I've mentioned with you and Aaron. I said, Hey, when's the last time you guys sat down for an hour and just talked about y'all without the boys? <laughs> so just having a, having an expert, having a professional that you trust to facilitate the conversation is a big deal. The other thing that I think a professional does is you've heard me say is can be an accountability buddy, just providing some level of accountability to say, where are you trying to get to? And then when you say it, making sure that you do what it takes to get there. So I think those are big things when it, when it comes to forming habits. Um, then, you know, another component is systematizing it. Um, don't, don't leave it up to you. Systematize it. That's one of the values of having, um, payroll deductions into retirement plans at an employer is that happens automatically. It's an automatic way of saving. And so anytime you can establish a goal and this is what we're going for, automate it, whether that's a payroll deduction or setting up an automatic payment into a 529 plan for college or whatever the case may be. So ask, ask a professional for help. They can provide support, facilitating a conversation, accountability, and then anytime you can automate your action. But here's one of the things where when Aaron and I had our first conversation with you mm -hmm. and we were talking about how we really don't have that much money. We're trying to be wise with it uh, while we're still semi-young. Uh, we're trying to make good decisions to set us up for the future and to set our kids up for the future. Um, I think one of the stigmas around financial advisors is that you have to have a lot of money in order to be advised on it, which I think 
if you keep saying, ask questions, find someone that you trust, find a third party. But, you know, we see and hear commercials about all kinds of people who want to help us, you know, and I'm sure that they would, but what, you know, like what type of person can receive help from a financial advisor? Or what are, what's something that you can offer to someone, just some help? Maybe there's just these misconceptions about financial advisors that you kind of like to debunk for us. Yeah, I think you touched on one of them, Casey, and that's just the concept that I think in our culture, in our country, is that you have to have in order to have. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many times I have been told, Garrett, we don't have enough for you to help us. And so I think that is, is the myth, is the lie that advisors that are, are truly trying to help are constantly facing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I don't know if why that myth has been created or frankly, because some, because of some realities, um, you know, we're living in an imperfect world with imperfect people. And there have been certainly instances where people have been taken advantage of over the course of history um, in the United States. And so I can understand why those, those myths exist and those perceptions exist. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't overcome them. And so for me, I, I would encourage you to not tell yourself that you can't be helped. That's the thing that I'm trying to overcome is for people to not believe that they are beyond support. Mm -hmm. And whether you have a dollar, a trillion or anywhere in between, you have the right to have somebody help you with that because that dollar is important or that trillion is important. And I've already said a lot of people on both ends of the spectrum ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. So don't tell yourself that you're not worth being helped. That's a lie. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Garrett, thank you so much for your time. Listen, if you're listening and you have questions for Garrett, you can find him on Facebook, Garrett Dickerson or on Instagram at real Garrett Dickerson. Um, or you can just email him Garrett.Dickerson at thrivent.com. He's been so helpful to us. Uh, nothing uh, on this whole podcast is for sale. Nothing is solicited. This is just Garrett sharing his heart uh, for us as parents, for us as adults um, to pass on to the next generation and take hold ourselves. So thanks again for listening, Garrett. Thanks for being here with us. We really appreciate it. Casey, it was an honor. I appreciate being asked. I know at the front end, Mary Ann said that he was going to slightly step on toes. Um, he may have stomped on mine a little bit, but this is good. <laughs> yeah. At least the, the, the younger me. And, and I think it's very important that he brought up this, um, the correlation of our health and our finances, our physical health, our relational health and our spiritual health. And how the truth is, is so many divorces and, and heartache and things uh, in our life that bring on this stress, a lot of them are money is at the root of it, not maybe money, but the mismanage of it, the lack of it, um, poor choices that we make. And I know for me personally, um, this has been a hard road. This was a tough one for me because like I said earlier, I didn't have anybody teaching me these things growing up. And as Dave Ramsey said, I, I paid more than my fair share of stupid tax <laughs> throughout the years and, and these mistakes. But um, it's really important to realize, you know, the, the only time I've ever been in the hospital, it was stress induced. I thought there was something physically wrong with me, like my stomach and all this stuff. And the doctor came in and I was expecting this, you know, big in-depth diagnosis with a word that I couldn't pronounce that I had. And he basically bottom lined it as stress. And so I think that um, that just goes to highlight the importance of financial literacy and and the last, you know, thing that he really said that hit me is, you know, he didn't say, you know, he said, it's never too late to embrace your financial journey, you know, and it's not like, you know, to better your finances, like it is a journey, 
it, it's like everything. There's a season for everything. And, and one of those, I just thought it was good to be in literate and know where you are. It's like when you get lost in the mall, you got to find the little, the, 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 the big, um, the big signs that, you know, that would orientate you to say you are here, you know, well, you know where you want to go, but you have to take an honest look at where you are before mm-hmm. you can move forward. And I think that's very powerful. One of the things I just want to kind of address to the audience um, in this space is that there can be a lot of a, sh- a lot of shame attached to uh, finan- finances and stewardship. And I just want to dismantle that um, today. And I just want you to know that I, I love that he said, ask for help. He yeah. said that multiple times in the conversation. And I don't want you to finish this podcast and feel discouraged or feel shame because you may not be managing your money God's way, but you have an opportunity to change that today. Um, and there are, and the word budget, I used to see the word budget as a, a word that would hold me in a corner. And, you know, nobody puts baby in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> but budget, that's not true of budget. Budget actually is allows you to know what you have so you can know how to give. And it, it is a freeing word. Um, and so I just, I like that. I, I, I don't want you to feel shame. I want you to feel freedom. And, you know, if you do feel like you're sitting under some stresses with your finances, find somebody that's wise in this area in your church um, or in your community that models consistency with their finances. They do exist. Um, Find them and meet with them and be vulnerable with them and let them see your numbers. That's changed so much for Chad and I is allowing some people into this area has given us accountability and set us up for financial freedom. And was it tough? Was it embarrassing? Yes. I'm just going to be honest. It was, but I'm going to tell you, it shifted the whole trajectory of our boat and how we lead and how we love our kids. And so I just wanted to say that as we dialogue here. Yeah. You know, there's people in our church that we can go to that we already know they do this really well. And just go and have that honest question say, Hey, I'm not asking you to share your personal finances. I'm asking you to share your expertise with me. Yeah. And there's an older couple, you know, out there that has done really well that would love it if they had a young couple come to them. And I'll tell you what, if, if they're really honest, they'll share with you the same mistakes that mm-hmm. you've made, because I, I know we've we've made our share of it. Um, one thing I did learn midway through or, or uh, somewhat midway through, I would say, in, in my career, it, it might have been a, it depends on your idea of age. But I tell young leaders this. There are going to be times through your career that you're going to get raises or maybe you shift jobs and the new job comes with a bit of a raise. I often look at the uh, young leaders and I say, I say to them, hey, I'm only going to say this to you once. I'll never look over your shoulder and ask if you do it. But I did just have this conversation with somebody recently as well where I know they got a pretty substantial raise. I said, consider not taking that raise in your take-home income consider tucking that away into your retirement. You didn't have it last week. And if you don't have it next week, then you won't miss it if you have to write a check out. And simply deducting that can make a world of difference. And, I, you know, I wished I'd have started that at, you know, 2022, but I started it more like at the age of 30, you know, and, and so a little bit later in life. But it's made a, a lot of difference for that uh Uh, interest income that's in the retirement side. So I uh, passed that one along as just one item that somebody else shared with me back in the day. You know, I was amazed by one disturbing item and and this this was really alarming. And I I think we can all identify that we've been in this 60%, but when he said 60% cannot cover a $400 emergency. You know, going back to uh, uh, Mary Ann, you talked about Dave Ramsey, probably the leading authority on getting our finances in order and having that uh, uh, go to emergency fund. You know, before we establish anything else, that if something, if the car does break down, the hot water heater goes out, we don't stress. We can go to and we can cover that in some form or fashion. It is very freeing when you have a little bit stuck aside for that what if moment or you get a call from a family member and you got to make a drive across country with the family. Those are items that, you know, can really just put a ding in, in our, our, our habits as such. I, I, I really identified with his foundational discipleship model of spend it, save it, share it. You know, the three S's, Mm -hmm. 
um, just cultivating that culture into your children. And, you know, what we didn't have, we want, we want our kids to have, like we want them to understand budget and wisdom with finances and that it's from God. And, you know, every good and perfect gift is from God and, you know, and, and work ethic. Let me just say that like work ethic has, plays a part in the connection point of our, our financial stewardship. <laughs> you know, we don't just wake up in, in, it's raining money. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to work for it. And I think work ethic is something right now. I've got a teenage son who's 13 and we're having a work ethic conversations quite often right now as a man, just him becoming a man and understanding you got to hard work hard, you know? Yeah. And anyway, so I, I value his um, financial discipleship statements. Those were very valuable. Well, I know it, it really helped us even when we were giving our kids not much allowance, you know, uh, very little. And they, it I would say it was more of a commission as he talked about, you know, the allowance versus commission. It's not just something you're getting for nothing, but, but even if it was $20, the importance of going, you need to save 10% of that $20. You need to get a give, give first, save second and live second, you know, give, save, live. But even, you know, they think and they look at, well, that's just $2. It's the principle of the matter and getting them to realize and hopefully ingrain that where it's just instinctual when they get money, they realize this is the way they divide this money up, you know, give, save, live, you know, and that's just kind of the way we've rolled. And by the way, these areas are spiritual. They're not just secular, these ideas. And, uh, you know, he did say that, you know, like Josh was talking about, finances affect our physical health, but they also affect our, our spiritual health and our emotional health and our relational health. In fact, uh, our D6 Everyday Curriculum uh, and our D6 Second Gen before it and our original D6 Curriculum all have a standing article from who we've been talking about, Dave Ramsey. It's an article called Common Sense. So if you get our devotional magazine for your family called Fusion Family, you're going to get that, that regular reminder once every three months over an idea that you can use, a, a coaching point, just like Garrett Dickerson's been sharing with us today. I just wanted to share this. You know, there was a couple that modeled this and it just blew me away um, for wedding gifts. When people would get, would get married, they would give Dave Ramsey's financial piece as a wedding gift. And I just thought, wow, what a great gift. What a great, if I 20 years ago would have understood the envelope system and the cash system and just some of those principles, oh, it would have just changed so much of my life. And so I just thought that was really cool. And I wanted to share it with our listeners that, you know, if you're in a different stage and you've, you're in like, you know, phase two of life, maybe into the grandparenting and you're just in a different stage financially, you know, it, you have a lot of wisdom to pour into younger couples and, you know, college students and even high school seniors, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, there's lots you have to offer the world in terms of stewardship. And so I just wanted to speak that into our audience today. So let's let that be a challenge. I want you to do two things as we close out the show. Number one, if you're in that earlier stage that Marianne's just referred to, identify an older couple in your church that you can go to and just pick their brain, get their advice. Or as Garrett Dickerson said, go ahead and seek out an expert. Uh, mm -hmm. Let them speak into your world uh, during this, this time. If you're older, do the opposite. Reach back to somebody younger. And if I can borrow a phrase from uh, uh, Alyssa who said, hey, invest in a relationship so you can invest in them for influence. Reach back to that high schooler, that college student or young married couple in a way that you can build a relationship and then speak into their worlds in this area of finances and other areas that God has blessed you in. So I want you to think through right now, even prayerfully, who is it that I need to go ask a question of or go build a relationship with and start creating that chemistry so that you can make all the difference in both sets of lives on the other side of this. Next week. We're going to have the Matsons with us, Jeff and Tara, and it's an interview you will not soon forget. Uh, in fact, we've been talking about it already, looking forward to it and the power it was as we listen to it in preparation for the upcoming episode. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week.
You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.